Welcome to the Adventurers Club Thursday Night Broadcast, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have a fun guest with us tonight. If you're looking for unusual things to do, this guy has the catalog of where to go and what to see <laughs> when it comes to that kind of thing. Uh, we've had some programs by uh, his organization before here, and they've always been outstanding, uh, participated in some of them outside of here and can highly recommend them. Uh, we have with us Dylan Thuris. He's co-founder and creative director of Atlas Obscura. If you haven't heard of it, you're about to find out some really interesting things to do. Dylan, welcome. Appreciate you hey. joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Sure. So um, tell us a little bit about uh, I'm going to describe Atlas Obscura as the go-to place to find weird things that exist almost anywhere in the world that you might be that most people don't know about and you want to go do something special. Here's a great resource. So, um, That's a good description. <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing that most people probably don't know about and uh, it's hard to describe until you've seen it. So tell us a little bit about how you got into this in the first place yeah yeah I'll, I'll i'd love to sort of take you uh through kind of what brought me to making atlas obscura kind of um the early seeds i guess in my life i'm really excited to be here by the way also i mean it's funny i don't it's always uh your members are you know often people who have done a kind of level of uh adventuring and exploration just in some ways just fear a uh, sheer physical ex exertion which <laughs> is you know i am a pretty adventurous person i've done a number of adventurous things but i'm i'm always in awe of, of people who sort of uh you know are are pushing their kind of limits uh of that and you know primarily i'm a media guy i mean that's i'm a i'm a storytelling guy i'm a writer Sure. Uh, that's really my my focus and my medium. And so, uh, you know, the way this all started here, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just share my screen here so you can kind of see some some of that. Uh, let's see and make sure this is working. Uh, yeah, if you guys can see this. So, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's it's uh, wonderful to be here. Talk about kind of hidden gems. Obviously, the the Adventurers Club is a hidden gem of LA. It was on our website. Um, you know, long, long before I ever talked to you, Ken. And, um, and so it, for me, basically, I grew up um, in, in Minnesota. I grew up in the Midwest, which I think this is pretty much what people picture when they picture the Midwest. <laughs> uh, and I didn't do a lot of adventurous travel as a kid. I grew up in a real like middle class, lower middle class family. So our big trips were not international jaunts. They were the kind of classic Midwestern road trip. Uh, everyone, you know, this is a movie everyone's familiar with. Uh, and that was what it was like. So we do these like long trips through Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, where you'd spend six or seven or eight hours in the car. And I remember like really early. So when I was about 12, we did one of these trips and we went to this place in Wisconsin called the House on the Rock. And it is still one of my all time favorite places. And it comes with this kind of amazing lore or legend behind it, which is the myth behind the house, very sketchy myth. Uh, but the myth behind the house is that there uh, was an architect named Alex Jordan Jr. who wanted to work for Frank Lloyd Wright, who was doing work right in this area. Falling water is, you know, 30 miles away from this. So he went, supposedly he went to Frank Lloyd Wright and showed him his designs and Frank Lloyd Wright told him that he wouldn't hire him to build a cheese crate or a chicken coop. And so he decided that he was gonna get architectural revenge on Frank Lloyd Wright. And he started building this house, the house on the rock, the house on the rock. And um, it's a, you know, you could, it's sort of in a Frank Lloyd Wright style. I, I'm, I've been known to call it a Frank Lloyd wrong because it's got sort of a lot of those pieces <laughs> But it's not quite right. But the thing about the house is besides sort of the architectural piece, he just started adding more and more and more. And over the course of decades, he added collection after collection. And by the time I got there, 
Uh, the house contained, among many other things, the world's largest indoor carousel with the world's biggest uh, collection of carousel animals. It had a room in it called the Infinity Room, which looked like it went on forever and is this kind of crazy cantilevered, uh, uh, unsupported um, point arching out from the house. And it has a sculpture of a squid fighting a whale that is the size of the Statue of Liberty, all inside <laughs> of this one house. Wow, that is a big and house. It, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it literally takes about five hours to walk through the whole thing. Uh, and, and as a 12 year old, I remember thinking if this is what is in the woods of Wisconsin, then what, what else is in the world? This was a kind of a moment of awakening for me. Uh, and so this was like a really early kind of seed of, of the work that I do now. And I didn't, I didn't make that connection until later in my life when I start after I started out with Obscura and I thought back and I was like, Oh, that had a big impact on me. And so, um, that's that's some of the earliest kind of like where Atlas came from. The, the other piece, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get out of screen sharing. Um, but the other piece that got in there as I got a little older and became a teenager, you know, I, I ended up living in, in Minneapolis, which is a, a city of some fair size and has kind of uh, that, you know, city infrastructure. And um, this is me as a teenager. I thought I thought I looked like this cool punk kid. Uh, on on the one side of the screen, I actually looked like that other kid <laughs> in the beanie. But I was uh, as a teenager in Minneapolis, I was a straight edger, so I didn't I didn't do drugs, I didn't drink, but I I was basically like a nerd who was into punk rock. But I did need to get into trouble because I was a teenager, and so the way that I got into trouble was through urban exploration. Uh, you know, I, I, when I was fourteen or fifteen, I'd sneak out of the house at two a.m. I'd bike across the city, I'd find an abandoned building, I'd go, you know, exploring in it. Uh, it, it was this amazing way to, to f like treat your city like an, uh, uh, an unexplored world. Like every corner, every rooftop, every underpass was a kind of like opportunity for, for, ex for exploration. And for me as a, you know, as a teenager, it was really, romantic and thrilling and and it really shaped the way I I saw what it means to explore like what it means to be an explorer this was not you know this was just me on a bicycle in my city um there was one place in particular that I fell in love with a uh a building called gold metal flower that was a one of the it was once the biggest flour mill in the world it produced something like enough flour each day to make six million loaves of bread and it was totally abandoned. It was this crumbling wreck. And the 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 top story of this, you know, three-story neon sign, gold metal flower sign. Um, the building's actually since been rehabilitated a bit, and the sign has been turned back on. But I just I spent hours, days, weeks of my life <laughs> exploring this building because it was just it was like a never-ending playground. And so th that was another really early thing that shaped what I thought. Uh, it meant to explore what I thought discovery could be and, and a big contributor to sort of the, what I would eventually go on to do, which is, which is found um, Atlas Obscura. So I'll stop sharing for a minute, but that's kind of like the, the proto stories <laughs> of some of the things that influenced me. So it seems like a good way to find dead bodies and other things you <laughs> <didn't> expect. <laughs> I never, no, you know, I never did. I never did find anything, anything quite that, that horrific. I mean, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of graffiti, a lot of, uh, you know, you'd run into other kids exploring or painting yeah. and, uh, but usually that was great. I mean, usually it was, it was just a chance to kind of talk to somebody about their own, their own experiences and adventures. And sure. it really was a fun way. It felt like I had a secret, uh, key to the city, like a secret way of even seeing the city, you know, because because I would just suddenly it became three dimensional. Every building was like, oh, I see someone's gotten up on that roof because there's graffiti up there. Like, how do I get up there? Yeah. <laughs> I know, you know, someone says, oh, there's a tunnel system. And so it's just it was a very um, a very fun way to explore when I was 15 and 16. Put all yeah. the puzzle pieces together, <laughs> yeah. figure out problems. Exactly. Interesting. Um, so yeah, how would. So so okay. you heard me describe Atlas Obscura. Um, 
how would you describe Atlas Obscura? Yeah, let me <laughs> let me tell you. Um, here, I'll throw. I'll, I'll jump back in actually. So let me let me pull back uh, some slides up, and 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 we can talk about what what I did sort of next uh, after the wayward teenage years. So Atlas Obscura, we consider it our mission to share a sense of wonder and curiosity about the world. And it started back in 2009 uh, as a passion project, basically, of me and my co-founder, uh, Joshua Foer. And the idea was that we were going to build a compendium of the world's hidden wonders, all these incredible places. And so people would contribute uh, places they thought belonged in the Atlas Obscura. We would review them, we'd fact check them, edit them, and then we publish them. And slightly incredibly, it worked. It was never, we never expected really this to be something that would not just become a full-time job, but essentially take over the next decade of our lives and, and, and grow to the scale that it's grown. Um, so it started as this kind of user generated uh, database. And that's still at the heart of it, you know, the, all of these places. Um, and the kinds of places that people were adding, it was really, it was really amazing. I mean, I think we knew in the first months that we had, we had hit on something. So like, you know, some examples of the kinds of places are like, obviously the Eiffel Tower is not one. Uh, it's, it's not particularly obscure. But the little apartment at the top of the Eiffel Tower where Gustav Eiffel would take people like Thomas Edison and other luminaries and, you know, have tea and look out across of Paris, that is a good example of a kind of hidden wonder in plain sight. Uh, and luckily now you can actually go and look at this um, and see a bit of it for yourself. But, you know, so it's sometimes it's stuff like that where it's more about realizing what's, what's hidden right in front of you. It's things like, the raw Paulette caves in New Mexico. So this is a guy who in his mid forties realized that, uh, uh, you know, his artistic medium was caves. So that meant that he would go around and find uh, natural caves uh, around the Southwest, crawl into them and then spend uh, months and months or years basically carving them into these incredible masterpieces. So, you know, places we're, we're a huge fan of at Atlas Obscura of sort of outsider art, um, these kind of one man projects. Uh, we, we really, we really love them. And so Raw Paulette's Caves are a good example. Things like Ball's Pyramid in Australia, which is this incredible rock spire. Uh, it's, 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 you know, twice the size of um, Empire State Building. And, uh, and it's cool enough on its own, but even better than that is that uh, about uh, early 2000s, a couple of entomologists went out there because they had heard rumors from mountain climbers. Climbers had been going here and climbing this since the 60s. And climbers were saying that they thought something might be living uh, on this spire. Uh, and there was in fact an insect that has been marked down as extinct since the 1920s. So a couple of entomologists went out here, basically assuming they wouldn't find anything, but in fact find the, found the last 24 uh, living Lord Howe Island stick insects, one of these giant, uh, incredible uh, insects. That's fairly prehistoric and looking. <laughs> it's, they're amazing. Uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were basically um, completely eaten when, when rats got onto the neighboring Lord Howe's Island. And so they had assumed to, to not exist, but somehow, and it's still not clear how, because they don't fly, maybe they floated over. They made their way to Ball's Pyramid, the island you just saw, and essentially set up a little colony. But, but by the time the entomologists got there, there was only 24 of them left in the world. So wow. they were able to take a couple of breeding pairs off and the Melbourne Zoo in Australia has, has basically brought this species back into existence uh, and it's been reintroduced now to Lord Howe Island. Uh, and so it's kind of this incredible story of, of discovery and, and of saving a species like right at the brink of extinction. And so that's like another place. And a, a last example I'll give is one that I stumbled across myself in 2009. And there's really nothing on it uh, or very little uh, on the internet. And I, I was at the, this is in the Florence, um, History of Science Museum in Italy. It's right around the corner of the Uffizi. So the Uffizi had lines that were like four hours long. 
And my wife and I, uh, we weren't married yet, but uh, we are now. Uh, we said, forget that. We went around the corner. I was dying to see this history of science museum. And they're like among these giant telescopes and our millery spheres and all this crazy stuff uh, was this little glass egg with a human fragment in it, this little, this finger. And it turns out uh, that this is the middle finger of Galileo Galilei. Um, oh, okay. And so about a hundred years after he died, it was, it was broken off by a, an admirer and it kind of floated around uh, loose for, for a while and eventually ended up uh, here at the History of Science Museum. And it's sort of an uh, irony because, you know, his middle finger, obviously yes. Galileo, <laughs> yeah, didn't, 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 uh, like wasn't on the best terms with the Catholic Church. So where this, where this middle finger is pointing is a little bit. It seems ap bit apropos funny. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, uh, and actually the, the museum is is slowly gathering. They've now have a, a few other fingers, a few vertebrae. I think if you wait long enough, they'll have a whole a whole Galileo there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so these are examples of the kinds of place in Atlas Obscura. And, you know, we are this database of 20,000 places uh, and we've added a kind of food section called Gastro Obscura. We have a book coming out at the, uh, in September uh, of the same name around, you know, sort of exploring the world world through its edible wonders. But at the heart of Alice is this database of 20,000 places uh, submitted by over a million plus registered users. And each month, basically, we get about 10 million uh, visitors who come to either, you know, plan their travel less this year uh, in terms of travel planning, but actually our traffic hasn't gone down very much because people also use the site to essentially just explore the world to, to learn about its curiosities and and its wonders. Um, and this is all in the in the aim of sort of this mission that I talked about of of reawakening people's sense of of wonder and curiosity. And so that's that's at the heart of Atlas. We've gone on to do a bunch of other stuff. I'll run through this pretty quickly. But um, we publish books. So we uh, our first big book came out back in 2016. It is. Um, it, it, it did very well. It is now the best-selling travel book of the last decade, which is a pretty wild accomplishment for, like, I feel, I feel extremely, um, you know, so many people ask if I've traveled to every place in the book and there's 750 places in the book. I've not traveled to every place. I traveled to a good, a good portion of them, but um, so I, I sometimes feel un, undeserving of, of, the, of the accolade, but it, you know, I think it just touched a nerve People were excited to explore the world through its kind of curious, lesser known wonders. Uh, we also did a kid's book a couple years after uh, that That was another New York Times bestseller. I got to do a big tour to schools, talk to kids, super fun. Really, I have to say, it really cured me of any public speaking fear because once you've <laughs> talked to a group of 400 seventh graders, like nothing- yeah, You've nothing got it under control. <laughs> That is really the height of 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 terror is is middle schoolers. Um, so you know we just this was just translating the book into a kind of an illustrated format uh, and and making it accessible to kids. And the the other thing we've done is is add um, basically uh, experiences and trips are a huge part of our business now. So we've we've gone on be, beyond just the me, the media. So this you might recognize this place. This is the Explorers Club in New York. We actually hosted a sleepover there. People got to touch artifacts, get to hear all the stories of the club. And uh, and that's one of a, a ton of different kinds of big events we do. We did a thing for the eclipse out in Oregon where about 500 people came out to truly the middle of nowhere and spent two days camping there. And we did a festival of art and science and music culminating in the best final act you can possibly ask for, which is a total solar eclipse. Uh, you know, oh. no credit to us on that one, but uh, <laughs> it was it was a good one. And, and then the other thing is, well, what was that, Ken? Just a small thing. Yeah, just a small thing. It's we we, we you know we called in some favors. Uh, <laughs> and and then the other thing we do is is um, is we run trips. So we are slated to run. 100 plus trips this year. We were uh, running 120 back in 2019. We were going to run a ton in 2020. Obviously, that that got kind of uh, put on hold. But you know, we we're running trips 
to places that just other people weren't even considering running trips to. So this, this is a little clip from the Bazludza monument in Bulgaria. And this whole trip is basically to abandon communist monuments throughout Eastern Europe. And like, that's just not a trip anyone else was doing. And it wasn't obvious that people wanted to go look at abandoned monuments in winter with us, but in fact, they did. We sold the trip out in, in like two days and we've been running trips like this since. So, so we run trips all over the world. We do stuff with scientists in the Amazon. We do, you know, species counts and like tracking burrowing owls uh, out in the Southwest. Like uh, that's become a huge part of our, our business is basically taking people to places uh, like, like Buzzludza. Uh, or this is Selena Turda in Romania. It's a, like basically a crazy futuristic amusement park at the bottom of a, of a salt mine in, in Transylvania. Uh, this is from one of those Amazonian trips where we stay with field scientists. Uh, we go out and do species counts with them too. Um, we encourage our travelers on every trip to make uh, make new friends uh, of of all sorts. I would say <laughs> um, huh. this is this is one of the species that they do a count of. It's a, a, a tailless whip scorpion, and uh, they look terrifying, but they're quite friendly. And so, I'm pretty sure I saw one of those in a cave in Belize. <laughs> that's very possible. Yeah, yeah, it's very possible. So that's, uh, I'll stop sharing for a second and, and come back to just the conversational format. But basically, we are a media and experiences company. So we do a ton of online publishing, we publish our books, we, in the in the loss of, of real life experiences of which we were doing tons, we pivoted really strongly into online experiences. So we have a ton of online courses. Um, where you can learn a new skill, you know, you can learn uh, bird taxidermy. Actually, with an incredible LA-based taxidermist, uh, Alice Markham, uh, yeah. she's, she's just fantastic. Um, so that's a course we're running right now. We do short, like you know, just an hour long experiences that are are um, everything from like you know Alice Obscura trivia nights to um, learning about basically the connection between West African food and food ways of like the American South. So that's, that's basically what we're up to. That's our, that's our, okay. um, and we, you know, we're a startup. So we've raised a few rounds of funding. Basically our, our, our last round, we raised uh, 20 million bucks from mostly from Airbnb, but our investors include A&E networks and New York times. And I, you know, I think all of it is just to sort of underline the notion that there's been a need for a long time for new ways of thinking about travel and discovery. Um, it's been very locked up, I think, for a long time. And so I think we filled um, a need that was not being met. And that sort of speaks, you know, just luck in a sense, speaks <laughs> largely to, to the success that, that we've, we've found. Um, so that's pretty much us in a, okay. in a nutshell. So I have some, uh, I'd like you to talk about a few different topics, go into a little more depth if you would. Sure. Uh, first of all, the website is amazing. Yeah. I've also seen the books, all very engaging and, and worth spending a considerable amount of time with. Um, on the website, this is truly worldwide. You, yeah. have, you have points of interest all over the world. Um, you have people sending things into you that You've got a great crew out there helping you build this. Um, so on the website, they can find things by topic, general topic, most popular keywords. Uh, they can search by country or city yeah. and, and find out what's in those places. So if they're going somewhere anyway, they can add to their enjoyment of the location by adding these things in. That's right. And I think you'll find in our listings stuff you're not going to find in other other places. It's kind of the point of it. Yeah. You'll find in our listing things <laughs> that you you won't necessarily find in other places. And, and that might be a small thing. It might be a, a plaque, you know, like uh, in Boston, you would never know it. It's it's but there's a little plaque about the Boston molasses flood, a giant flood of molasses that, you know, killed 21 people in 1919. And without someone kind of pointing it out to you and saying, hey, check that out. So it can be something as sort of um, really just focusing and saying, hey, something really amazing happened here. Or it can be like a truly kind of 
you know, world class, like travel around the world for it thing. Like, you know, the gates of hell in Turkmenistan is this giant burning hole. It's been on fire for 50 years or the living root bridges in India, which, which I liked to, when we published the piece on the living root bridges, there was not a single thing on the internet about it. There literally was nothing. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think we were one of multiple sources that kind of raised that up. But the beautiful thing about that is that now it's, um, they were disappearing because they had no tourist infrastructure. There was no real reason to keep them around and they take care and they're being replaced with steel cable bridges. And so, um, you know, one of the purposes of Atlas Obscura is actually to use the power of travel and tourism, this enormous economic force in the world, but it tends to get channeled in very narrow streams um, to just, just just disperse it, to, to, to bring people to new places and help use that power and that money to keep wonders around. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'll get, I, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the, the real, the thing that I see most often is, is things disappearing um, because people don't know they exist, that there's not enough people to like uh, advocate for them, to care for them, or there's not an economic incent incentive to keep them around. So it's very, that's a very important part of this whole thing for me. Sure. I can, I can relate to that because we took one of your LA tours, uh, well, we've done a few of them, but one in particular, we went to the old Griffith Park Zoo. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people probably know that it's there. They may have walked by it, but nobody talks about it. Nobody knows the story behind it or how it evolved. And uh, so we found it very fascinating to be able to walk through, walk into the old cages, walk up above and see all the secret doors. It was, it was a very fascinating day. Good. Well, it was a good workout too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Some of, some of us are less physically able than others. <laughs> yeah. It turns yeah, out. Yeah. yeah. But uh, um, yeah, the those programs are great. Now you've um, you've had to scale back on those a, a bit. Some of the local tour items because of COVID, obviously. Yeah. Is that yeah. uh, is that in your plans to bring those back when? We'd like to. Yeah. I mean, we'll bring back the trips first. Uh, the, the, you know, both domestic and then international. And then I think we'll, we'll slowly kind of reintroduce that, those local kind of uh, experience in real life experiences again. And one of the interesting things I'm finding is that you can mix the online experiences with the in real life experiences in, in kind of fun and interesting ways. So you can do an, uh, a virtual experience where people are maybe learning a new skill or learning the background of something and then pair that with a real life excursion uh, in the next week. And I, I'm sort of excited to explore that hybrid world uh, going forward. Huh. So we, um, your international trips, you go to some fairly interesting places. Uh, we booked a trip with you just before, it, for Iran, just before they started blowing the propellers off of cruise ships. Yeah. <laughs> so that yeah. didn't work out, but. It was gonna be a great trip. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we'll have to try again in a few years, but uh, but if you could just mention some of the kind of odd places that you guys go. We saw the, the giant monuments, obviously a yeah. wide angle camera uh, need there. <laughs> yeah, but definitely. What kinds of other things do you offer? Yeah, so I was going to take, <laughs> here, I'll tell you the two trip disasters that, that I've had <laughs> along with Iran. So uh, <laughs> um, just to, to give you a, actually a good sense of like, we we take trips to some challenging places, and then and that and then sometimes like they we for whatever reason it becomes you know difficult to run the trip. Uh, one trip that I did, and this was just uh, kind of a quirk of fate or luck. We were running a trip. We ran a trip to uh, to the Arctic to do a, a, a basically a Franklin expedition trip, and we were going to re retrace some of the Franklin expedition. We were going to go to Beachy Island. I was so excited. I got all my kit, you know, geared up. We were on a, about a hundred person passenger boat owned and, and crewed by a Russian crew. Um, you know, I do the, the long trip out there, uh, out through, God, uh, what is it? Edmonton to Silver Knife, is that what it is? Yellow Knife? Uh, and then, and then 
up uh, to this little little uh, Cougarook was the town's name. Anyway, it takes me two days to get to the boat. I get on the boat. I get all situated. The next morning, I'm like sitting in the briefing room, basically getting learning about how not to get eaten by a polar bear. <laughs> and we hear this incredible crash. And the boat goes 30 degrees off angle. Oh. And everyone knows that something terrible has yeah. happened. Not a, not a minor and bump. <laughs> not a minor bump. They had, um, they had stranded the boat. They'd hit a rock. It had oh. actually breached the exterior hull, but not the interior hull. So we weren't taking on water, but we were stuck. We couldn't move off that rock. And so we oh. were there for, for about 24 hours, a little longer. Uh, they closed the bar, those bastards. You, you would think that would be the most important feature at that point. <laughs> you would. I think they didn't want us all to be wasted when they needed to evacuate us. But we basically had to, we had, we hung out. My roommate was 91 years old. Uh, he was amazing. He had traveled everywhere. This was like a big kind of final uh, trip for him. He lived in Thunder Bay, Canada. Um, anyway, him and I hung out basically for a day. And then eventually the, uh, their other sister ship came. It made like national Canadian news because it's a good example as the Arctic is thawing and trips like this, which would have been maybe actually less possible are more possible, but they're also, they're also quite dangerous because the ice flows are moving in unpredictable ways. And no one's, the mapping there is terrible, which is why we ran into a rock. Like we, no. the, the, you know, the, and, and I think it's still like the sonar systems, it, 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 it shouldn't have happened. Somebody's got in real trouble, but. Um, That's probably that why they example. closed the bar. <laughs> yeah, as a good example of a trip gone wrong. When they rescued us and took us to the other ship, it was like eight in the morning, but that bar was open and boy, did everyone take advantage of it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we were all singing sea shanties by like 10 o'clock. But uh, anyway, that's an example of a trip gone wrong. But most of our trips, most of our 130 trips a year go great. And so, yeah, we do a trip to the Amazon where you uh, trek through the jungle. It's really a wildlife focused trip. <laughs> and, you, um, and you stay with field scientists and you go out at night and you do a species count of... Um, uh, tailless whip scorpions, uh, among a couple of other species. We have a trip that we're running. We were going to run it uh, in 2020. I was planning on going, and then pandemic happened, so we had to cancel out to Turkmenistan, which is one of the least traveled countries in the world. It gets about 5,000 tourists a year, uh, mm -hmm. which is like actually far less than than some of the other most restricted uh, countries in the in the world. Um, and part of it's because their visa process is insane. But we, we're taking people to Turkmenistan to see the gates of hell, which I mentioned before, this big burning hole in the ground that's essentially a giant industrial accident. <laughs> um, and uh, we go, we do other kinds of more kind of standard tours. You know, we do a food tour of Mexico, but of course it's our version of that. So it's going to, to places that are, are really not on the tourist radar at all. Um, or, you know, a, a, a Moroccan tour. We do a kind of back streets of, of Rome tour. So like our city tours are a lot about getting into underground spaces, unusual access spaces, like back rooms of museums that no one else has access to. That's kind of what we pride and specialize in is, is a kind of access usually to cultural spaces or, or um, just kind of incredible spaces that, that are normally not on, uh, on offer. So. Yeah, if you go to if you go to Atlas Obscura and look at our trips page, you can kind of see what we're what we're up to. Yeah. So you also uh, I noticed you also have it's not just architectural things or places, but you have um, spots that focus on animals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, abandoned places, ghost towns. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those seem to be some of the big hitters on the site. Um, yeah, part of what we wanted to do when we started is scoop a bunch of stuff up that just wasn't given any kind of it wasn't treated like this is worth paying attention to and, and put it all in one place. So that included, yeah, kind of abandoned places goes back to me as a kid exploring those abandoned places and, and loving them. I mean, I, I still think that kind of ruins and abandoned places are, are really interesting cultural uh cultural spots and, and tell you about a place. Um, 
outsider artist stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, animals we're, we're, uh, we're just starting work on our, on our third big book. So the first one is about places. Second one is about food and drink coming out in September, 2021 called gastro obscura. And third one is at least tentatively called a wild life and uh, like two words, wild life. And, uh, and it's about it's about animals and the natural environment, and so and that that, that extends to our experiences too. I mentioned, you know, we do a um, a wild bee uh, tracking trip where basically you're 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 with um, bee experts and you're learning basically about sort of the ecology of 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 wild bees. We do a trip down to uh, down to Mexico to the monarch. Um, spawning grounds basically the the, the where the sure. entire migration comes back to and and uh to understand that journey um and all of our stuff is sort of focused on really the the, the kind of science stories uh that help you help you really understand the, the environments yeah great stuff talk to me a little bit about the food oh sure things yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about sort of why, um, why I think that the, the work we're doing matters. And so I, I'll come, sure. I'll come back to that in a second. The food. Yeah. So gastro obscura, I mean, we see place when we started Atlas place is a lens to get into the world's great stories. Like I like when I started, I'm, I'm ultimately a storyteller, writer, media guy. And so, you know, we saw places as a way to explore the world and everything happens somewhere, right? So it's a really interesting, great uh, lens to, to, to explore with. You know, I think we wanted to do the same thing with, with food. So with Gastro Obscura, you know, it's just another way to kind of dig into the world's wonders. So it's everything from, you know, North, North Korea's uh, uh, newfound kind of love of breweries. North Korea like fell in love with, with brewing beer and basically bought lock, stock and barrel some, some breweries from the UK and, you know, basically were imported people to help them even really reassemble uh, those breweries. One of the really interesting things about North Korean beer is because of the power outages that happen there pretty regularly, they've had to reinvent a style of brewing, which dates back to kind of the 1800s, which is, um, if you ever had like an anchor steam, yeah. that's a, a specific kind of beer br brewed at a different temperature, essentially, that you don't need necessarily uh, electrical electric power to, to brew that style of beer. I mean, it's it's a kind of like gold miners beer right and and this is the style that is uh brewed uh, pretty extensively across north korea and so they you know because of kind of all of those constraints they become expert brewers in a few weird interesting styles of beer so that's like a so, good example of a so gastro beer thing, life for yeah. north koreans is looking up somewhat <laughs> well the beer the beer situation is definitely gotten better than it was uh you know 20 years ago um yeah, uh, I think like, so all basically all of everything we do uh, in food and drink is another way of exploring uh, interest. So we, sometimes it's about places, you know, sometimes it's about weird restaurants, restaurants built in old uh, planes and, you know, trains and that kind of stuff. Another story we have is about, you know, the German tofu king who um, was sent to prison for selling tofu because... <laughs> Germany was an extraordinarily uh, sort of protectionist over its its meat and milk industry. Um, uh, you know, we tell stories about, there's a guy in Minneapolis, which is my hometown, uh, named the Sioux Chef, but Sioux, like, uh, like the tribe. And, you know, he's trying to revive basically an indigenous um, Native American cuisine, which has almost been entirely lost. You know, if you think about the culinary landscape in any big city, you can get... Ethiopian food, you can get Korean food, you can get, you know, you name it, but find a restaurant that represents tribal food and you'll be hard pressed. Uh, and so we do stories like that. So that's, that's kind of the food focus uh, for, for Gastro Obscura. That sounds fun. Um, I might have to put yeah. some of that on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's plenty of good stuff in LA for sure. I mean, um, 
Uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. What is the incredible cafeteria you have in downtown? Oh, Famous. the uh, Clifton's. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's just a that's just a, a, a kind of great. That's just an adventure in itself to walk yeah. through there. <laughs> totally. Um, I think I want to, you know, if I have time, I'd love to jump back in and just touch on kind of why I think all of this matters and like what's happening. I think there's like a big shift happening in travel and tourism, and sure. I, and I think it's uh, what what happens next in travel will be really important. I think, it, I think the whole, the whole thing is going to shift. So, um, you know, let me see if I can, I'm going to bring back up my presentation. Yeah. 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 So, so one, now that I've been doing this for over a decade, you know, um, I've just seen how fast tourism is changing and you go from people, you know, using, like the cutting edge being like a lonely planet guide and like using that to kind of find stuff to, to having a billion sources, Atlas Obscura among them kind of informing travel and social media kind of being like fuel on that, on that fire. Um, people really don't want vacations in the same way that they used to. I mean, everyone, the, uh, there will always be people who want a, a, you know, sandals resort beach vacation, but the, the majority of people, I think, are looking for something a little more immersive and a little more sort of experience focused in their travel. Um, and and the other thing is his travel, as we've seen in the pandemic, it's the least understood economic force in the world. It employs one in 10 people. It is a you know trillion dollar industry. Uh, and and yet we and yet it's incredibly fragmented. So people have a very rudimentary understanding of how travel works as a kind of worldwide economic force. It's certainly changing the world. I mean, I think we all can see the ways in which travel has uh, has shifted. You know, whether it's shifting a destination's fortune, like Iceland, or or um, or even locally, how, how travel sort of shifts uh, neighborhoods. So. Travel is definitely changing the world, and in some ways good, and in some ways, uh, in some ways bad. <laughs> like, like this, like this guy. Um, so you know, you see the birth of, of really this kind of Instagram travel. So here's this is an incredible place in Norway called Trolltunga, um, and this one brave soul has has ventured out to the very edge to have this kind of true contemplative, you know, solitude in nature, uh, except. Actually, it's not one brave soul. Quite a number of people <laughs> have done that ex same, exact same thing. And if you get there, what you'll actually find is something that looks like this. Uh, uh. A giant line <laughs> of people waiting to take selfies at Trolltunga. And look, no shame. I get it. I get it. It's really incredible. It's a great photo. But I, I, you know, I think the truth is, is that this is a pretty disappointing experience for the traveler. And for, for me at Atlas, you know, separating fact from fiction, sort of helping people understand the reality of a place is really important. Being honest with people about kind of what it is. And also to, you know, for us internally, figuring out what, you know, when we want to send people to places because we think the travel will help that place. And when we want to sort of like maybe even delist that place because we think actually there's tons of people who know about it. They don't, doesn't need our help. You know, I think when people think about travel, they still have this very romantic, rosy image. And I, I'm mainly talking about sort of mass tourism here. I think this crew is all a bit more uh, sophisticated than that. But I think, you know, when people think of, of Barcelona, they think of, you know, this in, incredible uh, Sagrada Familia, the, you know, the church, they think of Croatia like this or Venice like this. But the reality is that uh, and during the high season, Venice actually looks like this. It's got 50,000 visitors every day. And Venice has 55,000 residents in total. You know, if you've been in Venice in the summer, you know exactly what it's like. It's a kind of hell on earth. Same thing with Dubrovnik. The, you know, this 300 town uh, center area, it takes a pedestrian 40 minutes to go through a um, uh, 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 tiny, a tiny block long walk. Uh, Barcelona sees 750 cruise ships dock each year, and uh, and it isn't going over very well with locals there. Um, you know, this is <laughs> it's it's a fair question. Uh, you know, 
over it's it's ironic because the pandemic has seen basically a complete halt of tourism around the world. But in the last 20 years leading up to that, you had the exact opposite problem, right? You had over tourism really uh, wreaking havoc on, on locations and just giving a, a kind of a terrible experience for everyone involved. I think the pandemic has actually provided a really interesting inflection point. And, and like I said, I think the thing that I see at Atlas is the other side of this. So this is a place in um, in rural Wisconsin, Rhinelander, Wisconsin. It's called Kovacs Planetarium. And this guy, Frank Kovac, built it himself. It's 22 foot diameter, uh, hand built planetarium. He painted with glow in the dark paint, all 5,000 stars. He built the mechanics and machinery himself. You sit inside of this, thing and it rotates around you. I mean, it's 22 feet uh, around. It's, it's pretty big. Uh, but he had to close it because he wasn't able to get enough uh, tourism support to keep it open. And he went back to work in, in the machine shop that he worked at. Uh, this is Margaret's grocery store in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, Margaret and her husband, Dennis, uh, got married in the 70s. Actually, her first husband was shot uh, in a robbery. She married uh, the reverend and um, and he told her that he'd build her a castle and he basically did. He went on to turn their home into this kind of incredible folk art uh, experience. And uh, it's, it's a really singular location in Mississippi, but they both passed away in, uh, in 2012. And it, it's, it's fallen pretty deeply into disrepair. It's it, it, there's a local artist working to save it, but it's not clear that it'll be able to be saved. And it's it's a real shame because it represents a kind of um, folk art heritage in the U.S. that that we should treat with the same reverence. You know, we're a young country, so things like this kind of folk art uh, actually fit pretty squarely in our, our cultural heritage and kind of cultural gems. And you know, so to see things like this disappear, it's it's a real. It, you know, it for me just shows me how valuable kind of refocusing tourism from a, a truly overcrowded place to an underloved place is. And I think um, I've been lucky to see the places where this has succeeded. So I, I have um, an example I love of this and a place that I stayed the night at, uh, an unexpected kind of example, which is uh, this, uh, the Clown Motel in Tonopah, Nevada. So basically this is on uh, the loneliest road, you know, Route 50 and, uh, and it's, uh, it's the last stop before you're truly in the desert for, for, for hours and hours and hours before you see uh, another, another place. And it's this kind of roadside motel with, uh, I think it's over 700 clowns. It's, it's, it's been decorated this way since the nineties. And it happens to be located directly next to the old miners graveyard, which is a hundred years old. And, <laughs> Perfect. It's kind of like the most amazing, you would you would think it was basically made entirely for a kind of schlocky horror yeah. film. It's just, it's absolutely delightful. If you weren't uh, afraid of clowns before, now you would yeah, be. <laughs> exactly. Um, but this thing that happened that's so great is basically the internet stumbled on this place, uh, you know, mid, mid 2000s. And it became this kind of um, like, cause and so people really started making pilgrimages out here and when they went out to to vegas they'd spend the you know the few hours the four hours it takes to actually drive out here and they'd stay the night and the thing that's special about that is is not just you know it's sort of a, a silly example but for a town like tonopah which has 2500 people in it for every one of those folks that stops by there, you know, they end up eating at the uh, other, you know, mitzvah hotel or getting a drink at the local bar. And having people come to the clown motel actually makes a, a real impact on the well being and kind of uh, tourism to this little Nevada town. And, um, so for me, that's 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 like one example of a kind of silly local success story, but it's it gets much more serious than that. Like I talked about the root bridges. So these are a piece of cultural heritage that is, you know, near unique in the world. Uh, and as it turns out, this is the most famous of, of them. There, this is a double decker bridge. And the reason it's a double decker is twofold. 
One, during the rainy season, this river can fully submerge that bottom bridge so that people take the upper deck. But also, actually, it's, it's just good civic uh, architecture. It's a two-way bridge, so it's, it gets busy. So people can go, uh, you know, you can have two-way traffic without having to wait. Um, and it's grown entirely out of, this is alive. This bridge is a living piece of the two trees that it's built out of. <clears throat> and um, it was going to disappear. It was going to disappear. Basically, these bridges, one by one, and there's there's well over a hundred of them spread throughout this region of India. One by one, they were being abandoned, and they need upkeep to basically survive. Um, they're over five hundred years old, but basically, it's much easier to spring a uh, string a steel cable bridge. Even though that steel cable bridge doesn't last nearly as long, they basically only last a decade. Uh, you know, so these things were, were very close to basically just falling off the earth. Uh, but people found out about them. And a decade later, I'm incredibly happy to say that, that not only is this bridge thriving, but all those other bridges, which are much less well known, are being uh, taken care of, new bridges are being grown, and there's a whole economic infrastructure that's been built around these things. This is one of my favorite places in the world. This is a place called the uh, Keshua Chaka or Last Incan Bridge. It's woven entirely out of grass. This is me uh, taking a little walk across back in, in 2010. And um, every year, the villages around this bridge cut it down, uh, harvest a ton of new grass and reweave a brand new gigantic suspension bridge, which can support about 50 people on it. Uh, and it's a, it's a remaining piece of, of the Incan empire. It's being made today in the exact same way it was during the Incan empire as part of the Incan road system. Um, and so it also had no tourist infrastructure. It's about three hours away from Machu Picchu, which sees you know, a bajillion people every year and is actually you know, having a real problem managing that. Uh, but it too has sort of been able to get its footing with a little bit of tourism and I think that will mean that this cultural practice will go on hopefully for decades and hundreds more years. So this is kind of the work of Atlas Obscura. This is what I've focused basically my adult life doing. I started Atlas Obscura in my mid twenties. Uh, and now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on, you know, forties just around the corner. And so um, this is as you know, this is what I've spent my life doing is, is trying to sort of get people to, chart new paths, to use those new travel paths, to support places that deserve to be supported, uh, and to appreciate the wonders that are in their own, um, are in their own backyard. And I, this is the last kind of thing I'll, I'll say is like, you guys are out in LA. And that is one of my favorite cities for exploring. I, there, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of places listed in LA. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, I don't know how many of your members have stopped by the Philosophical Research Library, but it's a great, incredible resource, both as a research resource and just as a beautiful building. Um, that's a great hidden LA spot. Another one of my favorite is a place called the Holy Land Exhibition, which is uh, really actually, you know, closely in a way aligned with the Adventurers Club. It's, it's, it's the collection of a guy named Antonia uh, Furterer, and he is often considered inspiration for Indiana Jones. He, he, he got sick, he recovered, and he basically dedicated his life to expeditions to the Holy Land, you know, on a quest for the Ark of the Covenant, hence the Indiana Jones connection, um, and bringing back a collection from Syria, from Jordan, from Egypt, from Cyprus, from Palestine. Um, and it's all in this little house museum in the kind of like a residential uh, part of, of LA. And this, uh, this woman who was his like assistant, who's now got to be in her 90s, I think she's still living, is, uh, is running it. And uh, it's just an amazing place if, if people haven't been. Uh, and of course, your, yours, yours truly. <laughs> The Adventurers Club is another good example of a, of a kind of real hidden wonder, but there are hundreds of them. You know, the story that I love, and this is the last thing, and we'll just go back to chatting, but the story I love to tell as kind of the, the example of this is, is as part of a big trip through South America in 2010, we went to this place called Gacta Falls, 
And Gokta was like in the middle of nowhere. It was this tiny town. I had no good uh, electrical infrastructure, I had no good road infrastructure, even into the, to the early 2000s. But it did have this gigantic waterfall right in its backyard. But it wasn't until 2005 that a, a German hiker came through the area and he looked at the waterfall and he said, geez, that waterfall is really tall. And he asked around, and he asked how tall it was. And it turned out no one knew. And so he did, he came back the next year with surveyor's equipment uh, and measured the waterfall, which is like an extremely German thing to do. <laughs> but he measured it and it turned out, it depends on how you want to do it. It's a two, it's a two part waterfall. So people get really fussy about like, how, whether it's the third or the fifth, you know, it's certainly in the top 10 waterfalls in the world. Uh, it's probably the fifth tallest waterfall in the world. That's, that's where I put it on the, on the list. Uh, and, uh, and no one knew about it uh, until 2006. And I went there later, I went there in 2010 and I asked the people in the town, why you are this tiny town that needed resources, needed economic support, needed attention from the Peruvian government. Why weren't you shouting this wonder that you had in your backyard to the, to the rooftops, to the heavens? And they basically said, look, you know, we knew this was, was you know, interesting. We knew it was beautiful, but we saw it every single day. And we just were used to it. And I basically, I think, you know, we all, we all live at the base of Gakta Falls. We all live next to these incredible, amazing places with unbelievable stories. And it's, it's up to us to kind of refocus our attention and see them for the, for the wonders uh, that they are. All, all we need to do is look around us to really find uh, wonder. And so that's, that's essentially the Atlas Obscura ethos, you know, is, is a, a kind of, um, that exploration discovery is a way of looking. It's not, you don't have to even, you don't have to board a plane. You can, you can really with the right kind of sense of adventure and discovery and curiosity, especially, you can find something amazing a hundred miles uh, from wherever you are. That's a great story about the falls. I love that. Yeah. So yeah. I have a question. I um, pretty sure our audience has some questions for you queued up, but uh, I have a question. It's probably stealing someone else's, I imagine. But <laughs> if you could name probably two or three of the weirdest things that you've <laughs> that you've run across oh. in the collections. All right, even one thing my, that just sticks out to you. Is my, <laughs> my, my, uh, my Overton window for what's weird is like way <laughs> expanded. Like, I don't really, I don't know what's weird anymore. Uh, I have things that are, were, are, were amazing kind of experiences or scary experiences. I went, uh, one that jumps to mind because it was actually from that same trip, um, Obviously, getting getting shipwrecked in the Arctic was a good one. Uh, but from that same trip to South America, I we went to Venezuela back when you kind of could go to Venezuela. It's a bit harder now, a little dicier. Uh, it was dicey back then too. Um, we we were on our way to to see something called um, the Relampego de Catatumbo, also called the Everlasting Lightning Storm. And so it is a place. It's one of the places in the world with the most lightning, you know, anywhere. So because of kind of confluence of geography and, and, and geology, uh, over this lake, uh, over Catatumbo, there is an almost constant nightly storm. It's, it's, it's like 260 nights out of the year. There's this huge, constantly flashing, interestingly silent lightning, because it's very high up. Uh, and it has something to do with the ozone coming up from the, the, the water. It's, you know, but basically we went out there to see this thing, but we got there too late. So we didn't arrive at the lake until after nightfall. And the fishermen who were going to take us out to the island um, like balked at the prospect. They, they, they basically said, we don't want to take you because we're afraid of, of uh, being boarded. They, they were afraid of base. There's river oh. and, and, and like lake pirates in the area. But what they did, they said, okay, we don't want to take you because it's after dark, but we're going to have these teenagers take you instead. And we were kind <laughs> Throw of the like, kids oh, to the pirates. <laughs> yeah. We were like, okay, but like, 
what about what about the um, the bandits? And they said the literal thing they said to us in Spanish, of course, was don't worry about it. We've given all the teenagers guns. We were, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, just what hmm. you want to hear. <laughs> hmm. We, we decided actually to not go out to the island. We went to a different part uh, of the lake and watched, you know, we could see it just fine from the shore. We were going to camp on an island in the middle of the lake. We ended up not doing it. Um, <laughs> God, other other incredible expeditions. Uh, you know, a lot of weird kind of outsider art stuff I love. I, this is one really close to you, actually. I loved this guy. He's since passed away. But out in Joshua Tree, like Yucca Valley, at a swap meet, there was um, a thing called Bob Carr's Crystal Cave. And he... Uh, he made it himself. He was in his 80s. He built it out of basically spray foam and chicken wire and paint and crystals and all of this stuff. And it was this little space that you walked into. It had a running waterfall in it. It was big enough for two people. You just like sit in there and there's this little meditative space. But the real joy of it was him. He would tell you these incredible stories about his life. He was this kind of philosophical madman. People called him the... Um, what was it? The Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva of the desert. I'm not pronouncing that right, but um, he just, he was just this wild guy. And I love that place mainly for him. So sometimes the places are about the people, um, you know, out in Colorado, there's another crazy outsider art project, this 16 story castle called Bishop's Cave that he built entirely by himself by hand. I spent a ton of time in Eastern Europe going around to reliquaries and osseries and um, things like that. I don't know. It's hard to choose. Uh, those are a few that jump to mind. <laughs> well, yeah, you guys inspired our, one of our past presidents, Eric Streit, to uh, explore. I think it was Naples, sort of uh, the collection of bones, the cathedral or, yeah. That was interesting. <laughs> the, 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 the number of reliquaries and ossuaries and severed saint heads, of which I've seen many in Italy, is like uh, in, the, in the many, many hundreds or thousands. It's, it's pretty wild. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, Andy, do we have some questions in the queue? Absolutely, Ken. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. And thank you so much, Dylan, for uh, being with us tonight. First yeah. question in the chat comes from Jay Nunn. Jay wants to know, is there a type of place that is peak obscura? <laughs> Things going for it. You might say there's a few different kinds of places that are peak obscura. Okay, so like a peak obscura place. It's now pretty well known because like a Discovery Channel thing like has this kind of corny show about it. Um, but we published it way back in 2009. Uh, so Snake Island off the coast of Sao Paulo, right? 90 kilometers off the coast of Sao Paulo. It's illegal to go there without the express permission of the Brazilian Navy because it's home to uh, a huge population, although there's some ecological concerns about the population, uh, of, of the most deadly uh, snake in the world, the golden uh, lancehead viper. Uh, which if it bites you, and, and the reason it's so deadly is they've estimated its, its population at one every square meter. <laughs> and they're also arboreal, so they're in the trees. So it's like a 3D matrix of death by snake. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty peak obscura place. But equally peak obscura is a place in London that was a collection of, um, it was the clown egg registry. It was a collection of eggs where clowns would paint their makeup styles on an egg. And it was basically a way of copywriting their makeup style. So it's this collection of 40 eggs with little clown faces painted on them, representing various famous clowns, basically saying, oh, you know, this is, this is the, the, the kind of my characteristic uh, paint style, don't steal it. So like both of those things, <laughs> very different, both kind of peak obscura. Thank you so much for that. Next question in the chat comes from Linda Abrams. Linda says, Dylan, I was on the Atlas Obscure email list for a long time and bought and loved the book, but seemed to have fallen off the email list. 
how to get back on? <laughs> uh, very easy. Jump on the website. There's a, at the bottom of the, the page, there's basically a, a field to put your email in. Just drop it in there. Um, you can also email me. I'm, I'm Dylan, D-Y-L-A-N, at atlasobscura.com. 10 years later and, and 10 million visitors a month, I still answer every single email that, that people send me. So if you say, hey, Dylan, uh, help me get on the email list, I'll make sure you get back on the email list. For sure. And thanks for, thanks for wanting to get back on. I appreciate that. Oh, and one more. If you could just say the website name again, just make sure everyone got it. it it's Atlas Obscura. Uh, a T L A S O B S C U R A dot com. Uh, and my email is Dylan D Y L A N at Atlas Obscura dot com. Okay. Thank you. For sure. Thank you so much, Dylan. Next question is where do you hope Atlas Obscura goes in the future? What's the next evolution of the, of the, of the thing, of the company? So it's a great question. We have we have a couple of things coming up immediately. So this year we are launching a podcast, um, which I am uh, the host of. I'm really excited about it. It actually launches really soon. It launches on March 15th. It's a uh, it's a daily podcast. It's only 15 minutes long, and the idea it starts out Monday through Thursday, and um, each day, you know, short little episode, 15 minutes. We're going to take you to a new wonder. So I'm really excited about that. I think it's been really fun for me to work on that. That's immediate. This summer, we're launching our app, finally. We've never had an app. Uh, you know, we have mobile web, we have the, the, the desktop site, but the app will really let you do travel planning and a little bit of serendipity. You know, it's gonna, hopefully it'll be able to sort of say, hey, you might not have realized it, but you're, you know, a mile away from this really interesting thing. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. And then at the end of the year, we've got Gastro Obscura, our next big book coming out. And I think that'll be really fun. The expansion into, into food and drink has been great. Some of my favorite pieces we've written of that. You know, after that, I'd love us to keep extend, expanding the trips that we do. And I have a real dream that someday, and, and you know, this might not be, it won't be this year, probably won't be next year. But that will really, I would love to spin off like a, a nonprofit wing that focused really on preservation. It's a, it's a part of our ethos and our core identity as a company, but it would be really amazing to have a, a, a really dedicated fund to preserving places that, that don't, you know, that UNESCO is not gonna do, right? Like UNESCO is not gonna do Margaret's Grocery in, in Mississippi. Uh, and oftentimes the other preservation uh, you know, major preservation groups in the U.S. also kind of miss that sort of stuff. And so I would just, that would be a thing that I would dream about doing. And, and then kids stuff is the other part. So I was the co-author of our kids book. We have, a, you know, we've got another kids book in the work probably for 2022. Um, and I would love to have a really robust kids program as well. So I don't know, more of everything and other things too, I guess is the answer. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Next question in the chat comes from Jay Nunn. Jay says, what kinds of user submissions don't make the cut to be listed? It's a good question. You know, we, we are still, uh, we get way more submissions than we can handle in our current process. We're hoping to change the process a little bit to, to open that up um, more. But, you know, sometimes people submit kind of whole towns and they're just like, hey, this is a cool town with some cool stuff. And that's not really what we're after. Other people submit really personal narratives. Like I went to this place and had an amazing time and it's all about them. And that's not really what we're after either. We really want it to be focused around a place and the places story. And occasionally, you know, it's just like, it's, it's you know, just not kind of, uh, it doesn't have something surprising or interesting about it. Frankly, people are sort of, you know, it just, it, it just doesn't kind of capture the imagination or it's very, very well known. And we will pass on that as well. Um, but people, people generally get it. For the vast majority, people understand what we're after. Uh, and we try and, and get to their listings when they do. Like sometimes it can take us a little longer than I wish it did. But, um, but yeah, we, we try and kind of honor when people come with, you know, a weird, interesting little place, we try and, and get to it. For sure. Thank you so much. A couple more questions tonight. Uh, is there anything you'd prioritize higher because it may not be around f for much longer? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think again, the, we have a sort of Hippocratic "do no harm," you know, oath in in thinking about travel and places. And so, you know, the questions we ask ourselves are about: Will sending people to this place help it survive? Will it bring economic value? Will it bring attention that will help it? Um, but yeah, I mean, if we if there are places that we think basically by by kind of being loud about, uh, it will help them survive. It will help them get you know preservation money or or just attention. Yeah, we definitely prioritize that stuff. And are there any places that are going away just sort of naturally, either naturally or or because of um, human intervention that you would say you should go to first? Oh, oh, like actually like specific recommendations of places that are going away. If there yeah. if you have any. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is like a bummer, but I mean, <laughs> everything being um, being eroded or swallowed by climate change, you know? So I, I think, um, you know, obviously like going to see, like there's a lot of glaciers that are receding at wildly uh, rapid rates. And, 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 you know, I mean, I think, uh, it's always good to make sure that the travel there is going to be supportive uh, and not and not do more harm than good. But but that's the stuff that comes to mind immediately. I mean, we also see a lot of places just close their doors or or have to uh, or sometimes if they're kind of like a band like Buzluza is a, Buz, Buzluza is a good example. It was very close to being destroyed. I mean, you know, it, it took an enormous it basically took. Bulgaria realizing that the rest of the world was interested in this thing for them to even entertain the idea that it shouldn't just fall into absolute ruin. So that's an example of a place that was like very close to crumbling and I think won't go over the edge. Uh, I'll think more, I'll think more about places that, that are like right at that, at that fulcrum. Um, it's a good question. For sure. Appreciate it. Final question of the night. If you were to do an Atlas Obscura, but for people, who would be at the top of the list? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. We've talked about doing an Atlas Obscura for people. You know, uh, there are mostly there's, well, it depends living or dead, right? Um, uh, LA, LA, you know, guy who I loved, uh, who I think is just incredible in a million ways. It was a, a magician named Ricky J collector, uh, writer, author, just actor, incredible person. Um, we're friendly with like Philip Petit, uh, who is uh, the you know famous wire walker between the, the, the Twin Towers. Um, he's an Alice Obscura person. Uh, guy named Sam Crossman, a volcano diver. Uh, he's an Alice Obscura person. I, I mean, it's a big list. Uh, you know, it, it uh, I, th I mean, there's also like really historical people like um oh, what's his name matthew Bach bachinger he he was a uh a guy born basically with without uh hands he was a dwarf he went on to become one of the world's greatest miniaturists uh so you would paint these incredibly elaborate miniature uh, uh portraits and paintings uh he's an alice obscure person that's a long, that's a long list. You would, you're, yeah, I would need to spend time like um, composing. I mean, I think there's both, there's explorers, there are artists, there are just general weirdos. Um, yeah, all of them belong in the Atlas Obscura of people. You guys, probably most of the people at this club <laughs> belong in the Atlas Obscura of people. That would be my guess anyway. All right. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Dylan's three hours ahead of us, so it's midnight yeah. around his. Yeah. So we we very much appreciate you hanging out with us and, and sharing with us. Um, I hope people find this fascinating. I did. Uh, go out and check out the website, buy the book. Uh, if you liked what you heard tonight, please tune into our YouTube channel, The Adventures Club of Los Angeles. You can see all of our past programs, including this one that's soon to be past program. And uh, subscribe to the channel so you can catch up with us every week and see what's going on. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thanks, Ken. <laughs>
okay cool we're clear